Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us?
And so, Father God, we receive Your invitation. We walk in. We come to Your altar. We love that You are here. And that we can be with You, Emmanuel. Emmanuel always. God with us. I thank You that You give us tangible places like churches where we can gather with other people, a building like this, to come in and say, we're here to come to the altar to worship our Savior. I pray that our worship today would be a sweet-smelling incense to you, raising to the heavens. In the name of Jesus, amen. You can have a seat. So we've uh, been working our way through the Old Testament. We've been using a tool by a group of people that refer to themselves as the Bible Project. I really love the work that they do. Uh, they, they do a series of Bible readings as well as uh, animated videos that give us just great teaching. And honestly, if you're watching these and listening to them, you're learning kind of at a, kind of at a level that you, that you don't commonly learn. You're learning uh, Hebrew words and what they mean and, and Bible backgrounds and all kinds of stuff that, that enriches uh, your reading of God's Word. So what I wanted to do today is actually show one of their, one of their teachings from Advent. We're into the, the second candle week. It's the second week. And as we come to this, uh, they're going to break down for us in a word study what the word hope means. I think for most of us, we think hope means something like this. Cross your fingers, cross your fingers. I promise you, the biblical word hope has more to do with than cross your fingers. So go ahead and watch this teaching. So let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation, and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible, and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the floodwaters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavas for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kava and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in Biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, at this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kava for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms, where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kava for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord, because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see, in any situation, how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires, and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus, and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kava for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believed that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope. 
and they use the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The Apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is. But biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about.
There are a few songs that we do that better express that word hope than the one that we just sang. That longing. You know, ever since Jesus left this earth, believers have been believing that Jesus could come at any minute. It's been a couple thousand years of hoping. Does that mean that our hope is unfounded? Does that mean that our hope is foolish? Absolutely not. Because hope isn't always getting everything you want when you want it exactly the way you want it. Sometimes it's that, that tense expectation, that waiting that's unresolved, and our hope is not in an event or, or anything that we might have. Our hope is founded in God alone and the belief that His promises are always true. And so we hope, even when hope seems unreasonable, and the Bible tells us, and hope will not disappoint us. We have that confidence. We have that hope. Go ahead and have a seat. Have a seat. And as you do, you're, you're staring at the hopeful manger. You're staring at that idea that very soon we will celebrate the birth of Jesus once again. And that celebration, what we've chosen to do this year, is, is to play on that last question that we had, that last soul question that asked, when's the last time you shared your faith with someone else? And so we decided to put some action to that and say, fine, uh, rather than like a full-fledged, let's go ahead and explain everything that we believe, let's start with the baby step. Let's pray for someone that they might come with us to Christmas Eve. And so all last week we were praying. We prayed for the person that we identified. Uh, some of us actually passed or posted to someone else. They were praying along with us. I came in here and others came in here through the weekend and prayed over the post-its on the wall. These names of people that we're praying would not only come to church, but would ultimately come into a relationship with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but some of these names I know, these names represent that kind of hope that's been going on for a long, long time. The hope, the prayer, the tense expectation that God will answer the prayers and bring these people safely home to himself. And so this morning during communion, here's what we're going to do. Just like always, you'll go to one of the four stations in the room, two in the front, two in the back. I should be saying six, because there are also two on either side of the stage that are a gluten-free station. So you have six all together. You notice that the post-its are still on the wall. And today what we're going to ask you to do is come and take one. Take one. Not, not the one you put up. Take one and just promise to pray over that person. So now you'll be praying for the person you invited, or you're hoping to invite. You'll be praying for the post that someone handed you, and you'll have this one as well. Three prayers that you'll be offering up to God. As I've prayed over these through the week, it's been interesting. I look at a name and I'm like, I don't know this person. But God, you do. You know every one of these people. You know every detail of their lives. So go ahead and get communion. Take a post-it back to your seat. You might even take that post-it and, and put it on the card that you've received today. You have two of them. Two invite cards because now we'll move from praying to praying and asking. Making that, extending that invitation. So I have thought about the complexities of this. You're going to be holding a piece of bread a cup, and then going for a post-it. I think you can do it, but if not, we have fantastic janitorial service, and they know how to get grape juice out of the carpet. So we're not even going to go to silence. We're just going to go straight to a song, a beautiful song that is a song of invitation, bringing people safely home to God. This baby boy who's come to earth to bring us joy and I just want to sing this song to you it goes like this the fourth the fifth the minor fall the major lift with every breath I'm singing
will gain to better him expecting joy they search the inn to find a place for you were coming soon there was no room for them to stay so in a manger laid with hay the lonely son was born oh hallelujah 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 Shepherds led their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. It was just as the angel said, you'll find him. Star shone bright up in the east to Bethlehem. The wise men three came many miles and journeyed long for you. And to the place at which you were, the frankincense and golden myrrh they gave to you. baby born would grow to be a man and one day die for me and you my sins would dry the nails and you that rugged cross was my cross too still every breath you drew Well, our servers are going to come and receive the offering, and uh, if, you're, if you're new with us or newer with us, welcome you, of course, and two things you'll want to know if you're trying to find out more about our church. Uh, one is to head to the Welcome Center afterward, very well-informed people that can answer your questions. The other is to sign up for the links. Uh, we do this every Sunday. It's an email that goes out eight in the morning and gives you some of the things that you need every week as well as some other things that are just announcements that we're covering that week that are important, and it gives you the link to go to to connect with right away. So, for example, one of the links that's coming up uh, at the beginning of the year, we're going to be doing another blood drive on January 7th from 4 to 
made a couple of improvements on this, I hope. The last blood drive we had, they, they had a few too few volunteers, a few too pieces of equipment. Some of you waited a little longer, so we said, basically, we're not doing another one unless we can get the extra stuff. They promised to do that. So, uh, and the other thing that'll be different is you're, you're signing up straight through their website yeah. now. So this link will take you straight to that website. But will you be doing a double again? I actually am already signed up. All right. So, and yeah, you, and gotta... you figured out how to beat Bob on the time? I mean, I've been watching YouTube videos, trying to, you know, like, all right, how do you get <clears> blood faster? What can you do to, like, thin it out? I, there's, there's nothing I can do. Nothing just, you can he's do. He's too quick. He's, he's just, too, it's like, he's, he's like the Usain speedy. Bolt. Yeah. of giving blood. Yeah, it's, I found it's personally that if I eat a lot of grease ahead of time, oh. my blood slides out a lot better. Love it. So, yeah. No? I will not Okay, that. forget that. <laughs> All right. What's going on with you? Uh, yeah, students, we have a couple of things coming up. Next week, uh, we're actually going to be taking off two weeks at Christmas time, so Christmas and New Year's that, uh, that week, but that means next week is like our, our last week before we take that break. We're going to have a, like a smaller Christmas party for both groups, which is a really cool thing. Uh, as we talk about inviting people to Christmas Eve and bringing people in, this is a, a great time for students to invite their friends. Because uh, again, it's gonna be, they're going to be just low-key nights uh, where they're going to hear the gospel, they're going to hear uh, the things that they need to hear, but also have the opportunity to, to do some random, really fun stuff. Uh, another thing that they can invite their friends to is Arctic Blast. That's open to everybody, junior high and high school. Uh, the high schoolers are going to be going up to Lake Geneva uh, the last weekend of January. The junior highers will be going up the next weekend. And it's, I'm telling you, they call it Arctic Blast for a reason. It's a lot of fun. And there's some really intense teaching, really great worship. Uh, it's, it's a really fun time. So if you haven't signed up, again, we have that deadline coming quickly. Uh, and I just wanted to throw out there, last week as... Wrapping things up, uh, the, there was a couple who randomly donated uh, like two scholarships to help students go to uh, Arctic Blast. It was totally unprompted, and I, when I heard about it, like again, that that always like strikes a chord with me. Uh, it's it's so meaningful, and I love I love how you guys support students. Um, and I, again, just thank you for that. Thank you. Awesome. I, again, I said it several weeks ago, but I love the spirit that you created in our group. Friday night, we had a group of people here uh, having a celebration of first impressions people, you know, old people, people like over 30 and whatever. But, our, but a bunch of our high schoolers were here. And, you know, I, my memory of being in high school as well as other high school groups I've seen, if high schoolers came, they came, uh, they ate, and they ran out as fast as they could. They were some of the first, they were some of the last to leave, and they just enjoyed hanging out together the whole night. I mean, it was, it was really cool to see. And it's a nice lead-in to Christmas Eve, because I think that's part of what we're hoping to accomplish with the other Christmas Eve services. We're going to have two of them going at the same time, one in here, one in the gym. The other we're calling the Family Fun Christmas Eve. And part of the reason for it that I love is... A lot of times when we come to church, you know, like you're sitting here right now, and you're sitting over there, and your friend is sitting over here, and you're thinking, man, I wish he'd stop talking so we could just hang out, you know? And, and we don't get the hangout time when we're sitting like this. But that night, your kids love coming to church to be with their friends, and it's a night that they will have absolute freedom to be with their friends and see their friends on the night of great anticipation for them. I mean, they're getting great toys yeah. and, you know, socks and, and, and clothing <laughs> and all that great stuff. So, um, so anyway, I'm just, I'm really excited about some of the pieces that are coming together for that Christmas Eve service are amazing. They're going to be a lot of fun, kind of crazy. <laughs> you know one at least? Kind of crazy, yeah, really it's, crazy. It's, it's, it's going to be, really cool. be a good time. So <laughs> you want to get the invite out for that. We've given you the card uh, to be able to, it's got the image that we've been using as well as the explanation of the choices on the back. So you've got two of those. We have plenty all right? We ordered plenty, so you don't have to limit yourself. You've got to use them, of course, but we have plenty. In fact, I have four blocks of 50 here, and I'm literally just going to leave these up front. If you want to go ahead and take those and, and shower your neighborhood, go around and put them on every door, those will be up here afterward, and you can grab those if you want. So do you have anything else to add? Well, just that these are really cool conversation starters, one, but also, I mean, like, if you have that person who you know, you're, you're kind of nervous about inviting, drop, just dropping it on their desk at work or, you know, again, slipping it in a backpack or something. It, it can be, it's, it's a really cool opportunity. So definitely take advantage of the invite. Great. Yeah. Have you ever gotten a ticket? 
with you in the car, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have yes. gotten a ticket. I, yeah, 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 I've been pulled over a time or two. A State time Farm or two. But, but Riley never has, right? <laughs> she's got one. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. She's actually, yeah. She's, yeah, she's, she's doing she's, okay. She got one. All right. So we've had a little confession here. Thanks so much. Uh, we need some room light, by the way, because we need that for this. So I've been thinking Good. a lot about this. I'm realizing <laughs> I'm that I could cause some big problems uh, asking this question uh, from this standpoint. One, I might cause some uh, family problems. You need the overhead lights, Bob. Um, they're, they're like not coming up. There. Okay. So anyway, I need to do that more often. Um, so this question is, have you ever gotten a ticket? And I, I, I'm, I'm fearful to ask it because some of you, if you raise your hand right now, you'll get in grave trouble with your spouse or parent who does not know. And so I decided not to force you because the other side would be you keep your hand down and you lie in church. Bad, bad thing to do. So if you are willing to to admit that you received a ticket at any point in your life for something driving, put your hand in the air. Oh my goodness, a lot of revenue in this room. Okay, so here's my, no, keep it up there because you're going you're gonna to drop it purposefully. But some people are holding multiple hands up. Yes, <laughs> multiple hands. So whether it's a ticket or numerous tickets, I want you to just kind of get the general vibe of this. If you believe that you deserved your ticket, put your hand down. Yeah, notice mine is up because I've gotten a ticket, and notice mine is up because I did not believe I deserved that ticket. So anyway, so here's a here, fun story. So back in the day, I'm going to Trinity in Deerfield, and it's kind of an uppity community. You know, got Bannockburn and Lincolnshire and Deerfield. Lincolnshire, really, really fancy places, you know? And there's this road that I'd take to get to school, and there were multi-million dollar mansions on this road. And these people have manipulated the village to the point that there were certain times of day you were not allowed to drive in certain directions on the road. They had actually a gate that came out that said, can't go this way right now. So, I mean, they had all these signs everywhere that you, I mean, you kind of tiptoed through that area because you were going to get busted for something. So I drove very carefully and very aware all the time. I came up to a stop sign. I stopped. I started to go, and as I started to go over here in the bushes, I see a police car. And sure enough, it starts to move, and it starts to move toward me, and the lights come on. And so I do everything I'm supposed to do. I'm thinking about where the license and registration are. Hands are nice where you can see them. Window is rolled down. Good day, officer. How are you? Uh, can I help you with anything? And, and he says, uh, do, you, do you know that you, uh, you rolled through that stop sign back there? And I'm like, well, I, I didn't think I did, but if you say so, I guess I did, but I didn't, you know, because I'm being polite and whatever, and well, that was held against me in a court of law. So anyway, um, I, you know, kind of, he goes back to his car, he writes me this ticket for $40. Now, I'm in seminary, $40, that might as well have been a $400,000 ticket. I'm like, we can't afford to waste 40 bucks right now, that's a lot of macaroni. So I went to court in Waukegan, I'm fighting this puppy. I walk into the room. Every person in the room was there for that road. I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm like, Your Honor, come on, look around the room and think about this. So my turn comes. I've got pictures. I've got the whole works. And the judge finally says, you have a good driving record. Don't worry about it. No, no problem. You're, you're good to go. On that time, I did not think I deserved it. There's another time, however, I fully deserve my ticket. We're living in St. Louis, brand new, got into this house, brand new neighborhood. We had to go somewhere, and so we're headed out of the subdivision. And you go kind of from the comfort to the subdivision to right out to the, the busy street, and so, and so we're easing on over there. Come to a stop sign. You see, I've got this stop sign theme. In fact, I got stopped another time for a stop sign. But anyway, I come to this stop sign. Maybe it is my fault. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, come, I come to this stop sign, and I stop, and right over here, this person in the car waves for me to go and I recognize him it's my new neighbor I'm like oh how nice waving for me to go I love this subdivision it's so wonderful and so I pull on out and as I pull on out I turn this way and 40 miles an hour coming that way as a car boom and I say Kim we're gonna get hit boom spin boom land are we okay yes get out I don't remember much of anything I don't remember the person I don't remember much of anything that happened the slow motion thing is exactly like they say the whole works so it's done and I'm standing over by the stop sign 
police officer comes, officer comes over to get my story. Now here's the cool thing. The neighbor stayed. The neighbor stayed there. The neighbor's standing right there. And the police officer starts collecting the story and, and, and you know, basically says, so what happened? And, and the neighbor says, do you mind if I cut in? I waved for him to go. I waved for him to go. And, and, the, and the police officer very politely said, what does this sign say? S-T-O-P. Oh, I didn't realize it was a two-way stop. I thought it was a four-way. It's a two-way stop. It says, this is the law. Your neighbor can do all this you want. But this is the law. And I went, guilty as charged. <laughs> Take me in. It's over. Sometimes we feel like we deserve it. Sometimes we feel like we don't. We have an interesting relationship to the law, don't we? People have an interesting reaction to the law. People break the law. They despise the law. They ignore the law. They subvert the law. They avoid the law. They change the law. They throw the law out. They fear the law. They hide from it. You get the point. People have a natural tendency to run from the long arm of the law. But people in the Bible had a unique reaction to the law. They loved the law. People in the Bible loved the law. In my list, I only mentioned negative reactions to the law. There are positive ones as well. We can obey the law. We can defend the law. We can, yes, create new law, enforce the law, uphold the law, and even challenge the law in a lawful manner. I have to say that overall, I have a positive reaction to the law. But personally, I cannot say my reaction has been to say, I love the law. Israel loved the law. Today, we're going to look at the last book in the Pentateuch. Remember, the first five books are called the Pentateuch. Uh, the law of Moses, those five books together. We're going to look at the last one, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is quoted over 80 times in the New Testament. Only Genesis, Isaiah, and the Psalms are quoted more often. It's a very influential and powerful book that turns the heart of the people toward God. In Deuteronomy, we dis discover that God sees his people, he knows his people, and he's committed to transform this nation into a nation that honors him and reflects his righteousness in a world that is dark and that is full of sin. This same God wants his children to be transformed through the process of growing in knowledge and in love of the law. Now imagine the setting for a moment. The people of Israel are about to enter the promised land after 40 years of waiting. Tense expectation. Waiting and waiting. They're excited. They're afraid. They're overwhelmed. They're curious. Moses is not going to be going with them. For 40 years, they've relied on him for their spiritual leadership. And now, they're going to be moving forward without him. For them, this is the start of a new adventure. And for Moses, this is the end. Moses is going to die. He knows it. They all know it. This is a poignant moment in their history. These are the last words of Moses. The last words he will say to these people who he led and who he liberated. He has struggled with them. He has wrestled with them. He's yelled at them. And he loved them. He loved them with all of his heart. Deuteronomy is structured as the final message that Moses gives to these people. And it comes in the form of three sessions or three talks. It's interesting that when Moses comes to his retirement party, he doesn't do what most of us do at our retirement parties. He doesn't reminisce about his career. He doesn't talk about his greatest accomplishments. Rather, under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, he gives one more appeal to God's people. He calls them to follow his plan, to follow his laws, the laws that he wants to write on their hearts. Deuteronomy is a desperate plea for the people to remember to follow God's law. The name Deuteronomy comes from two Greek words, deuteros, meaning second, and nomos, meaning law. In other words, it is the, the second telling or the second giving of the law. God knows we all need reminders. And Moses brings the people of God back to that truth that they've already heard, and they need to hear it again. They need a review. And so we start the book, Deuteronomy chapter 1, says that these are the words that Moses spoke to the people of Israel. He gives their location on the east side of the Jordan River, gives where the camp was, 
The Bible says normally it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, where they're going, if they go by way of Mount Seir. But 40 years after the Israelites left Egypt, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses addressed the people. An 11-day trip took 40 years. The Bible says while the Israelites were in the land of Moab, east of the Jordan, Moses carefully explained the Lord's instruction as follows. The first verse gives the location of the people, and the second verse gives this editorial note that we touched on two weeks ago. A trip from where the people were to where they were going normally took 11 days. A trip that normally took a week and a half took 40 years to complete because of their disobedience. The writer is subtly setting a context here. A whole generation of human beings wasted their lives in the desert and lost the opportunity to enter the promised land because of their refusal to trust God and to do what he said. The writer is also saying to future readers, readers like us, don't make the same mistake. Don't blow 40 years of your life on an 11-day lesson. In the first three chapters, Moses reviews what God has done and how the people have stumbled and messes up, messed up. And he gives this appeal. Now, Israel, listen carefully to these decrees and regulations I'm about to teach you. Obey them so that you may live and so that you may enter and occupy this promised land the God of your ancestors is giving you. Do not add to or subtract from these commands I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God. Obey these commands I am giving you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, is very familiar territory to us. We declare them at almost every family dedication we do. In these words we see that God's intent is clear. He wants us to remember His law, and not just for the moment. Not just, not just now and forget it is for generation after generation after generation. He doesn't want us to remember the way we used to remember in high school. Do you remember cramming? Do you remember remembering everything you could really, really fast and putting it down on paper and then saying, whew, don't have to think about that ever again in my life. It's over, yay, done. No. He wants us to remember the facts for the lifetime. He wants us to remember so deeply that it cannot be shaken loose. The picture that God paints in Deuteronomy is vivid. Teach the law to the next generation and talk about it throughout the day, anytime. Just talk about it. Reflect on it. Celebrate it everywhere you go. Do whatever it takes to remember God's law. The people of Israel did not see the law of God as some whip-cracking taskmaster that ruled over them. They loved the law of God. They saw how it was lifting them out of the chaos of darkness of sin and closer to the heart of God. To get a sense of how much they loved the law, look at these words from Psalm 19, words of David. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. They make, the wise, make wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The law brings joy. The commandment of the Lord is radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and they are altogether righteous. He says they are more precious than gold, than the purest gold that you can find. They're sweeter than honey, sweeter than the honeycomb. And then he says, through the law, your servant is given fair warning, and when we keep them, there is great reward the passage ends with a verse that, that is worth quoting and praying every day of your life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing or acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. What was the purpose of the law? The law did not just teach people how to live. It did not just teach right and wrong, do's and don'ts. The law didn't just teach people how to live the law taught people how to love. It taught them how to love. And we learn how to love by looking at the law. So the rest of our time, we're going to look at two aspects of the law. 
We're going to look at laws regarding giving and generosity and laws regarding feasts and celebration because both of them are about love. So let's start with the laws on generosity. One of the first words most children learn to say with passion and energy is the word mine. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. You've seen it before. It is a cheap laugh, but I love this picture as they squabble. And you can see their personalities. Shelly never winning a battle and Brian saying, I did it again. I did it again. Oh man, just fighting over that school bus that I wanted to throw in the trash. By our nature, we are selfish and we seek our own good. There is a magnetic pull toward self. Listen to me. Stop looking at the picture. (laughs) God is committed to helping us learn the joy of generosity. He wants us to see that giving and sharing are part of His plan for our maturity. Deuteronomy is filled with instruction on how God's people were to grow in a spirit of generosity. And as we study Deuteronomy, we will discover that God still calls His children to a life of generosity that grows out of a profound understanding that we love God and we can trust Him. God's call to giving began with what was called a tithe, 10%. Leviticus 27.30 says, One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the tree, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to Him as holy. 10% serves as God's biblical standard for the starting point for His followers. Now some people have a pretty intense reaction to that, 10%. They're like, wow, that's a lot. What most people do not realize is that 10% was not the stopping point for a faithful Israelite. In the Sabbath years, they were to give more of their income. This is found in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 to 7. In the Sabbath years, they were not to do anything with their land. They weren't allowed to plant. They weren't allowed to make money off of it. They just needed to let the land rest. The land took a Sabbath. Just like we're supposed to. Just like every seven days we're supposed to stop and rest, the land was supposed to take a rest. The one thing they could do, whatever sprung up naturally, they were allowed to eat. Which if you grow tomatoes, that happens all the time. But outside of that, they were not supposed to do any planting. They were not supposed to be selling what they had. This was a year of rest. Every seven years, the people were not to plant anything. No sowing, no reaping. They were to let the land rest. This meant that they would give up all of their income every seven years. On top of that, Deuteronomy 15.1 taught that people were to cancel all debts in the Sabbath year. Can you imagine? You can see people rushing to buy the new car at six and three quarter, right? Every seven years, every seven years, the debts were canceled. They were forgotten. All debts to celebrate God's goodness and provision. Imagine the relief that was felt when debt was canceled. I'm suspicious there were a lot of people celebrating in the seventh year. But generosity did not end there. In Leviticus 8, uh, Leviticus 25, 8 through 12, God teaches that every 49 years, God declared a year of jubilee. Like the Sabbath year, it was a year for the land to rest. There was no planting or harvesting. It was also a year for debt to be forgiven. And people were freed from bondage. And in a jubilee year, all land would go back to its original owner. Every family got its original inheritance that was established at the time of Joshua. There are two jubilee years every every century. You know what? We're not done. On top of that, there were the gleaning laws. You remember the gleaning law. We read it. it. It would seem that the Israelites who gave tithes or reserved the Sabbath year the celebration of the Jubilee, that they would have done enough. Think about it. Most experts say that this adds up to about 26% of their income. But they're not done. We have these gleaning laws. We saw this verse that talked about the fact that if you leave a bundle in the field, you're not supposed to go back and get it. That when you're you're harvesting your olives, you don't have to get every olive off the tree. That when your grapes fall to the ground, it's okay to leave some. You're supposed to leave some for the foreigner, for the widow, for the orphan. You're supposed to just let some be there. God is telling people to be a little sloppy when they farm. They could have gone over the field twice. They could have gotten every olive off the tree if they'd worked just a little bit harder. They could have gotten a a little larger profit at the market and gotten a better return for their investment. Why did God do this? Because God knows there's something in the human heart that says, I've got to wring every 
ounce of profit out of this. I've got to get every dime that I can. And so to counteract this selfish tendency, God institutes the gleaning laws. These laws encourage God's people to be generous toward those who were in real need. Leaving some in the field or some on the trees gave the poor the opportunity to harvest a little and to help with their own needs. Final conclusion, most experts agree that a faithful Israelite gave about 30% of their income over to the Lord. Faithful Israelites would give an average of 30% of their income to God and those in need. People often think that the Old Testament talks about 10%. The truth is, an Israelite who is devout would have given closer to 30%. And it would have been higher if you partook in free will offerings which were common among the people. What is God up to? What's he doing in all this? He's getting us to purge our hearts from that word that we've been saying since we were two. Mama, dada, mine. Word number three, mine, mine. He wants us to be purged of that word. My blanket, my toy, my happy meal, my chainsaw, mine, mine, mine. This propensity to be selfish is deep in the heart of every human being. God is saying, I want you to learn how to let go. I want, to prov- I want you to provide for someone else. I want you to learn to say, not mine. In reality, God is not just teaching us how to live. God is teaching us how to love. The goal of the Old Testament law is never to simply make us mechanical in our responses. God doesn't want us to grudgingly write the check or do whatever. He's not looking for a mechanical response. Look at Deuteronomy 15, 7-8. We read, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hardened or tight-fisted toward them. Rather be be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. What a contrast. Hard-hearted or free. Tight-fisted or open-handed. How would you rather be described? How do you think God wants his children to be described? So let's try a modern application of this ancient law. Two for one sales. I love them. Buy one, get one free. Isn't this a good deal? I mean, look, I got two cans of corn now, not just one. This is amazing. Woo! What if every time I did that buy one, get one free, I said... This was an olive on the tree. This was a grape on the ground. This was a bundle I left in the field. It's free for crying out loud. I didn't pay a dime for it. What if I took that and gave it to someone else? What if if I brought it to church and put it out in the pantry and just had that that very tangible reminder that I I don't have to grab and clutch every little thing in life? We already talked about, you know, the whole like the garage sale concept. God is not anti garage sale. But sometimes, my goodness, the things we try to sell. Are you kidding me, really? I, don't you think it's possible that someone might get more benefit out of having given it than getting that 39 cents that they haggle down to? Oh, but I got the 39 cents. It's mine, mine, all mine. We were going through a bin the other day, a blue bin. That, it's so fun when your kid moves out, you finally start to clear Now, the fact is, we had stuff at Kim's parents' house until we were 45, so it takes a long time. But we find this blue bin, and it's got weird things in it. We're looking. Brian didn't even know where half this stuff came from, but one was a pair of ice skates. I'm like, where are these from? He's like, oh, that's a pair I got. Didn't need them. Got some better ones, size 10s. They were a little small for me, and I'm like, well, we'll give them to someone who wants them. You know, we're not going to try to get our buck 95 for them. There's got to be someone out there with a size 10 foot that wants to try ice skating. We'll give them to someone who wants them. It's a grape on the ground. Let someone else have it. Anybody want some skates? Size 10. They're yours for free. <clears throat> this practice will be a simple reminder that God calls us to be generous toward those in need. That we don't have to clutch everything we have. Now, please hear me. God does not want our money. Sometimes when we talk about this stuff, it's like God wants our money. He's not into our money. God God owns it all, you know? He doesn't need our money. God wants our hearts. He wants us to learn to be generous. He wants our hearts. 
He wants our nature to reflect His, and He knows that more often than not, in material things, that's where we learn true generosity. Those are the laws that focus on generosity. Let's look quickly at the laws of feasting and celebration. We just experienced a great holiday, Thanksgiving. We're coming up on Christmas. Two great celebrations of the year. We understand the concept of national holidays. The Israelites were the original partying nation. They loved to have fun. Too often we see God as solemn and angry, and we miss the reality that God is filled with passionate joy and calls his children to live in a commitment to celebration. The book of Deuteronomy recounts God's call for his people to gather for festivals and times of joy-filled remembrance. God calls his people to regularly celebrate his goodness. They had three major holidays that they were to celebrate in the law. There were many others, but three major ones. And I'm going to give you an analogy from a, the modern American experience. So you see these three, the Passover is like our Independence Day. It's like Fourth of July. The Festival of Weeks is like our Labor Day, at the beginning of harvest, a time to take a rest. And the Feast of Tabernacles or Shelters or Booths is at the end of harvest, like our Thanksgiving. You have Passover. Passover was that day that celebrated the fact that they had been released. They had been released from captivity in Egypt. They become independent. And unlike us, you know, we celebrate our heroes like, like Washington and Franklin and, and Jefferson, the third president of the United States, and John Hancock, and all these other people. Yeah, last week I said second. I know Adams, poor Adams. He was so sad when I said it. Anyway, unlike us celebrating our heroes, God is the hero of the Passover. And they celebrate this hero who didn't even have to do one piece of battle. Boom, it was over. And the people were rescued. Deuteronomy 16 says, In honor of the Lord, celebrate the Passover each year early in the spring in the month of Abib, for that was the month in which the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt at night. There's one word there that you cannot miss. It's the word celebrate. Celebrate. Only a God of sheer joy would command his people to have a week-long party every year. Celebrate. Celebrate. The second feast was the Feast of, of Weeks, or our Labor Day. It's found in Deuteronomy 16, 9 to 12. It came at the latter part of the growing season, just as, just as they're about to go ahead and harvest the crops. It's like our end of summer celebration, a day to honor those who work. Is the Israelite feast also celebrated hard work and God's provision. It's important to note that everybody was supposed to enjoy this. Families, servants, foreigners, orphans, widows. No one was to be left out. And then there's the final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles or shelters or booths, kind of like our Thanksgiving. It's described in Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 17. During this feast, the people would actually live in tents to remember their time in the wilderness. In the modern day, we might call this like the Feast of Campers or the Feast of Pup Tents or, or the Feast of Winnebago's. It, it came at the end of the harvest after the entire harvest had been collected. And just like Thanksgiving for us, the meaning was to remember their origins, to remember the, the early pilgrims who came out of Egypt. Two words are inextricably tied when we look at these events. Celebrate and rejoice. Celebrate and rejoice. It was commanded. God is not only concerned that we grow to be generous, He wants us also to grow to be joyful. Generous and joyful. Just imagine how winsome that would be to a world that does not know God. Too often the church is depicted as, as judgmental and grumpy. Generous and joyful. That's God's calling on us. Live into that kind of spirit. Imagine the difference that would make in our world. Imagine that way that would win people over to Jesus. Many people think the Old Testament is a story of a dark, grim God overseeing a scared and somber people. It is not so. God calls his people to be joyful. The feasts were a kind of, of training lesson for joy. A lot of people have trouble being happy, but God is ready to grow us in this area as well. What are you doing to develop some joy in your life? How do you use holidays, for example? You know, we just came from Thanksgiving. What does the T in Thanksgiving stand for for you? Touchdown? Turkey, time to shop. I remember growing up, 
be driving to church and, and there was this sign all the time that said, keep Christ in Christmas. Seems like we need another campaign. Keep thanks in Thanksgiving. We need to remember that it's a day to give thanks. Christmas is coming. Is it about presents? P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S? Or is it about presents? P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. Is it about a gift that you're going to get or give? Or is it about the presence and reality of Jesus in your life? Is it about being together for a celebration and doing all we're going to do or just sitting down and being fully present with the person you love? Joyous and generous. Two great tests of every Christ follower. Are we joyful or are we grumpy? Are we generous or are we Grinch-like? Please, don't take 40 years to make a decision that should last a moment. It should last a moment. God's calling on us is generosity and sheer joy. Now, you can't leave Deuteronomy without looking at the end of the book. Deuteronomy chapter 34. We come to the end, and we're going to say goodbye to Moses. And if you've read through this story, by now Moses for you is a good friend. And it's like coming to a funeral of a good friend and you don't want him to go, but the guy's 120. You've got to go at some point, right? 120 years old. The Bible tells us in his 120 years, he was still as strong as he was. His eyesight was still as sharp as ever. 120 years old. Older by 40 years than anybody in the community with the exception of two friends. Old, old man. And he comes to the end of his journey and God brings them up on Mount Nebo. He says, I want you to check this out. And they stand up there and they just check out the whole promised land. God's pointing to this spot and that spot and showing him this place and that place. And we don't know all the details of the conversation. I don't know how much he let him in on. But he's just showing him everything. And then he gives that gentle reminder, by the way, you can look, but you can't enter. Now, I don't know about you, but... This just sticks in my throat. This stuff, it bugs me. It bugs me. Because Moses, what did he do? God says, speak to the rock, water come out. He goes, rock, water. <laughs> Hitting the rock, and he can't enter the promised land. We look at that and we kind of go, that's a little harsh. It's a little harsh. A few years ago, I was involved in some a learning, a, lear, a time, a season of learning, and teachers talking about this particular passage. And as they were talking about this passage, it was like all of a sudden light bulbs went on, boom. And I finally got it in the way that I never got it before. Teachers said it's as if God and Moses on the mountain are like that old couple sitting on the porch. They're just sitting on the porch and they're looking out over the future, a future that, that they won't necessarily be a part of, but they're looking out over the future and all the goodness that's coming. And they're looking at all that and they're saying, all of this is great, but you know what's really great? That we get to be together. That we just get to be together, you and me. The book ends with this verse. Never has there been another prophet in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. You see, here's what I've grown to be convinced of over the years. That Moses says, entering the promised land would be nice, but I'd rather be with you. It's time. I'd just rather be with you. I don't think there was an ounce of resentment or regret. He said, let them enter. I just want to be with you. Back in college, we had a great, great college president. His name was Paul Dixon. He'd speak in chapel every Monday. And quite often, he'd lead us in a chorus. He was a poor singer. But it was a cool song. Very simple. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. There you go. You had the whole song right there takes about seven minutes. So, <laughs> sing those words through. And you have all these 18 to 22-year-old voices lifting up this beautiful song. 
Later in the night, they'd air chapel on the radio, and people would gather in the dorm, and the dorm was a big U-shape, and they'd all get their stereo speakers facing out their windows, and they'd blast playing this song, Christ is all I need, Christ is all I need. I think most of us would agree Christ is all we need. Well, what if I took a twist on it? What if we asked the question, he's all you need, but is he all you want? Christ is all I want. Hmm. You see, he knew he needed God. But Moses wanted to be with God more than he had to be in the promised land. He wanted to be with God. I wonder what is it like that promised land that you've been longing for, you've been waiting for, you've had that tense expectation, it bugs you. There are times you even think, God, I've done all the right things, I've checked all the boxes, I've done exactly what you asked. Why am I still waiting? Is Christ all you want? Is Christ enough? If you never get your longing, is Christ enough? I really believe that's what the journey of the law is all about. Not just to teach us how to live, but to teach us how to love. To teach us how to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, and all of our strengths. And so as you go through this week, might you pray the prayer, not just God, I need you, but God, I want you. I want you more than anything I ever thought I wanted. I choose you. Now, God in heaven, I pray that you will use the law, not that we might feel reprimanded or condemned, but that we might learn what it means to say, I love you, to you, our Father, to our families, to our neighbors, that we would love the way God loves you are all we need. I pray that you would be all we want as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So don't forget to take your cards with you. Don't forget to give your card. There are extras at the Welcome Center. The 50 packs up here if you want to hand them out to neighbors. Enjoy your week.